Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, hi, hello, welcome. I'm Sherilyn. I'm so glad you found me. If you're not new here, welcome back. Thank you for joining me on our True Crime Wine Wednesday. I've freaking missed you. It pains me so much to miss any uploads, but I know it's just necessary for certain stories and this one it was. Partly because I had a different story planned for this week and then when I uploaded the Cecil Hotel, a lot of you guys wanted to see me do a story on the Black Dolly and I was like, you know what? I also really want to do that instead. So it just kind of like pushed everything back. Anyways, here we are. We're finally here. I missed you. I also wanted to say thank you guys so much for the love that you sent me on the last video. I really didn't intend for it to be any nonsense that had come my way, but it really meant a lot that you guys all had my back, wanted to just like lift me up and tell me to drown it out. And it's you guys who really make like any of those moments so, so small and insignificant just based on how much you guys support and love me. So I really, really appreciate it. I just wanted to say thank you so, so much. It meant everything to me to hear from you. Moving along, it makes those comments even easier to handle because I know I have an amazing crew behind me who has my back. So I love you guys so much. All right, guys, let's get started. Let's get settled in. Grab your snacks, grab your drinks, grab your rag if you are cleaning the house with me. I know a lot of of you I get comments that you bring me along while you're cleaning or working and I think that's so cool <laughs> you know I feel like I'm like in your house along for the ride helping motivate you get everything done so thank you for bringing me into your life with you I also want to show you guys my t-shirt because it feels like it's like all you can see is like <laughs> you're killing and it's like but this is like one of my favorite t-shirts it says you're killing me smalls from the sandlot classic Okay, let's get going. Black Dahlia. To be honest, I really didn't know what I was getting into with this case because I obviously knew of Elizabeth Short or the Black Dahlia as most people know her by. I knew the way she was found. I knew that she wanted to be in movies and I knew that it wasn't solved, but I really didn't have any idea who she was. So that's kind of what I focused on. So today, that's what the story is going to be is mostly about her because I feel like so much of that has gotten brushed aside and it's more about like the condition that she was found in. So today I want to share everything that I learned about Elizabeth and what brought her to Hollywood and ultimately how her life ended there. So when she was found, it was actually a mother and her three-year-old that were out for a walk that found her body. The mother, as they were approaching, thought that she found somebody that was just kind of laid out naked on the grass. And then as she's approaching, the skin was just so pale and almost like waxy that she's like, well, this is not a person. It has to be a mannequin. And then she notices that it's in two. So she's like, it's definitely got to be a mannequin, but something about it just didn't seem right. So she was like cautiously trying to like steer her little one away, but still looking and she realizes, no, this is actually a person. I think one thing that I didn't necessarily know about the way that she was found was how neatly everything was. Like it wasn't just a big horror scene. It was actually extremely clean, thus making this woman believe that it was a mannequin that had just like fallen off of a truck because everything was just like neatly tucked back in her. There was no blood. She was completely clean. So obviously this isn't where she met her demise. Something else that showed that she was purposely put there and staged almost in the positions that she was, was the unnatural way her body was. I mean, aside from the fact that she was not whole, she was placed strategically. She had her arms like above her head with her head tilted to the side and then her legs were off to the side. So it wasn't even like in line with her body. And from the sidewalk, you could see like the way that her face was tilted, this exaggerated smile is how it's explained because her mouth was cut from each side almost to her ear. Like I always assumed it looked more like we see people do for Halloween where they have, you know, the little cuts there and they're all done up and it's just these little slits almost like the Joker. The real condition is nothing like that at all. It was horrifying. I actually didn't even intend on coming across the photos as close as they were. I'd seen ones that were posted on the newspaper. So it was just kind of off to the side, but you could definitely tell, okay, like, yeah, that's where the legs are. That's where the body was. So I had an idea of 
how everything was. And I'd seen a photo of her face from the autopsy after it had already been put back together somewhat so that they could airbrush over and use it as a composite sketch to try to identify her in the newspaper. So even then, like it was still easier to take in. The real photos are so much more drastic. It's basically like her whole upper face right here that is completely like cut and wide open. So it's not as Hollywood as I in my mind thought it was. So imagine finding this just on your stroll with your three-year-old. This woman is obviously horrified. She runs to a nearby house. She calls the police. They get there. And quickly as they're looking at the scene, they're obviously figuring out that this is staged but right away they're also feeling like somebody pretty skilled had to have been involved specifically when it came to the way her torso was cut because it was in a position where someone knew that at that point between like the hips and the ribs it was much much easier to cut through and there wasn't going to be like a struggle to get through and it was clean, like with really clean precision. They also noticed that she had suffered some sort of attack prior. She had some obvious signs of a beating around her head. There were ligature marks around her wrists and ankles. And her body almost seemed like toyed with. There were pieces missing and just cut out. But at the scene itself, there was zero evidence as to who could have done this, who brought her there. The only thing they had was a cement bag that was off to the side by the bushes. And when they went to investigate, it had a little bit of almost like washed, like remnants of like washed away blood on it. And they figured that was how whoever did this transported the body and like dragged it onto the grass and then left the cement bag on the side. And that's pretty much all they had. There's none of her belongings. They can't find a purse, there's no clothes. So when they take her to the coroner's office, they are able to lift her fingerprints and they're hoping that they can identify her this way. And I thought this was really interesting because back in the day, usually the way that they would do this if they were sending it out you know, like abroad to target like a lot of departments or like military and stuff like that. They would send the prints through air mail, but they wanted to identify this woman really fast. So this was one of the first cases where they used wire transfer to send out the prints and get them a lot faster. So within a day, they actually had a match and they figured out that the woman they found was Elizabeth Short. She had applied for a job four years prior in Santa Barbara and for this position, they required your fingerprints. So that's ultimately how they found her. And from there, they started to learn more about Elizabeth. She was 22 years old. She was born on July 29th, 1924. Her father was a man named Cleo and her mom was a woman named Phoebe. Cleo was a World War I veteran. He was a hardworking man. He was a mechanic and he had his own mechanic shop in New Hampshire. And Phoebe sounds like a very independent woman, very much a go-getter. She wanted the best of life. She wanted to strive for the next best thing for her family. Her title was essentially housewife. She took care of Elizabeth and her four sisters, but she also was really intelligent and she helped Cleo do all of like the bookkeeping and inventory and just kind of kept the shop, you know, in tip top shape for him. And she could see that Cleo was a great businessmen. They were running a really successful business, but she thought that, you know, as it was kind of at its peak, they could probably sell it and make some money and then move to Boston where they had family and open up another business and find even bigger success in that. I guess around that time, that's when mini golf became the hot thing to do for like dates and stuff like that and things to do with your family. So she wanted to open a mini golf of their own in Boston. Initially, Cleo was really cautious. He's not the kind of guy to take any risks. He figured the business is doing fine. There's no need for us to sell it and, you know, risk upping and moving the family to Boston to hope that this is going to work. So it took some time, but eventually, I think when Elizabeth was around two years old, he did decide to sell the business, move to Boston, and they did open up a mini golf. They opened the business in an area called Medford, and I guess it was a good spot for the family too. It sounds like a really cool place in those times. I'm not sure if the vibe is still the same, but back then it was described as like a historic town. They had like the cobblestone on the ground. They were known for their rum distilleries, which is like 
right up my alley. I love me a good booze tour of sorts. So I wonder, I'd have to look into Medford and see if that's still a thing in Medford. So it turns out that the golf course was a huge success. The family ran one of what was known as one of the best mini golfs in the town at that time. And so the family got a taste of the finer things in life. They like completely refinished their home. They upgraded to like a four bedroom house in a really nice area. And they were walking around a little bit more glitzy than they had when they had moved there. Unfortunately though, not long after is when the Great Depression hit. And like we talked about in the Cecil Hotel story, it affected everybody and unfortunately the business couldn't survive because I mean people couldn't even feed their family let alone have extra money to go and entertain their family at a mini golf course. So initially it appeared like the pressure of losing the business was too much for Cecil. He had just disappeared one day and they found his car near a bridge. So they believe that he had jumped off the bridge and they were unable to recover his body. So Elizabeth's mother, Phoebe, sounds like the mother that you would want in a devastating situation like this. She was left to deal with all of these creditors coming for her. She had to feed the girl. She didn't know how she was gonna do it, make ends meet, and she did. She didn't ask for handouts. She sounds like a very proud woman, very strong-willed and like, okay, this is the situation we are in. We are not gonna ask anybody for help. We got ourselves into this. We can get ourselves out of it, and she did. They downsized their family home. She got a job as a bookkeeper and they made it work. I guess one of the ways that she would try to keep her daughter's spirits up in this time was to occasionally take them for nights out to the movie theater. And back then that was, it was a big deal. It was something that you got dressed up to go and do, not like now where I'm just like in the comfiest clothes that I can possibly find so that I can eat all the candy and popcorn. <laughs> But then, you know, you, you got your little dress on, did your hair, did your makeup, and went out to a night on the movie. So that's what they would do for fun to just distract themselves from everything that was going on. And out of all the siblings, Elizabeth loved doing that the most. And that ambition and that love for movies and to star in them stayed with her from that point on. One thing I didn't know about Elizabeth was that she was severely asthmatic. Asthmatic? Asthmatic. Hey Siri, is asthmatic a word? As an adjective it means relating to or suffering from asthma. That's good, thank you. That's what I do in my life. I mean, I knew it sounded like a word, but when I said it and it came out, it just didn't sound right. I don't know, you know has that ever happened to you where you just like think of something too much or say it and you're just like, that's that's not a word. Has it, has it always been like that? Anyways, that's where I'm at right now. Sorry guys. So I read in those days, it just wasn't easy to pinpoint, you know, what triggered asthma and changes you could make to try your best to just like keep it at bay. And the family had two dogs and two cats. And when Elizabeth was home, it seemed like her condition was worse. And then when she was out of the house, it was better, but they never seemed to tie the two together. And when she was a teen, it had gotten so bad that she was hospitalized and eventually needed surgery for it. So after the surgery, the doctors were like, you know, one of the best ways we think that she can try to minimize, you know, it flaring up again is during like harsh winter conditions. She goes somewhere where there's not such like an extreme flux fluctuation in the weather. So around 16 years old, her mom would send her to go and stay with family and friends in Florida and going there seemed to help her. So that was just a routine that they had kept and it worked. I got the impression that she really liked Florida. She'd stay in Miami. There she picked up like a very sophisticated flashy style. She also found some independence by working odd jobs. One of the jobs she had was actually as an usherette at a theater, pretty much because she liked the perks of being able to watch movies as she was working, which is brilliant in my opinion. So everyone in the Short family finally seemed to be settling in, recovering from all that they went through during the Great Depression. They had jobs, were finding an independence. And then out of the blue, Phoebe gets a letter from Cleo, the dad, and he's very much alive. 
So he says that he's living in California and he didn't really intend on abandoning the family, you know, and like leaving them to tend for themselves at their lowest point of life and fending off creditors and investors and scouring the streets for food and standing in lineups for hours at a time just so they could get like a sample of free milk because that's what they had to do. And he's like, it just turned out that way. His defense was that the longer it went on, he was hoping that with him gone and them not recovering his body, it would be easier on Phoebe and the girls to find resources to help if she was a widow as opposed to him like up and leaving the family. And then he finishes off the letter basically asking Phoebe to give him a chance to pick up exactly where they left off and to let him come home and Phoebe's like heck no. She's like well, although you didn't intend for all of those things to happen, they did. And you very much did abandon the family and we made it just fine on our own without you. So thank you, no thank you, Bye bye Learning about Elizabeth, I feel like she also had that, you know, a little bit of that tenacity, that stubbornness, that will to make it and be independent that her mom did. She also had this gift to naturally draw in people. The fact that she was very beautiful, probably didn't hurt the situation. But everybody wanted to talk to her, especially men. And she wasn't one of those women who was really self-centered and conceited. She was never like, oh, like, look at that guy looking at me. No matter what you looked like, like there was one gentleman, for instance, who really had a great friendship with her. He was like buck tooth and like not the best looking guy ever by his own accounts of himself. And she was also always so lovely and gave him all the attention in the world when, when they were together and never made it feel like he wasn't good enough to be like in her presence. And even though she was away from home a lot, spending time in Florida with friends, when she would come home, she'd make sure she'd make the most of that time, especially with her sisters take them out to movies, take them on a little shopping date where they could pick a little trinket or something special just to make the most of those situations. I read she even did stuff like that with like the little neighbor girl that the family was close with. So I got the impression that she had a, a big heart. And like I said, everybody knew as far as her goals and aspirations, she wanted to make it big. She wanted to move to Hollywood and be in the movies. And it seemed like she had that opportunity when her dad ended up sending her a letter after it, you know, didn't go too well with Phoebes. And he wanted to know if she was interested in moving across the country and staying with him in California. So she talked it over with her mom. As much as her mom didn't really want her to go, she understood that this could potentially be a good stepping stone for her to make her big break. So she supported her. But when Elizabeth got there, it wasn't like all it was cracked up to be. It seemed like Cleo just wanted her to kind of forget about everything that had happened and him like leaving the family and just pick up where they left off and almost for her to still be quite innocent as well. Like she was a teen at this point. So a lot in her life has changed. Her interests are not the same as being a little girl that he had just packed up and left on. So it doesn't end up working out. He thought that her interest in going out on dates was inappropriate, even though I mean like every young woman at her age is interested in boys. And he said he couldn't relate to her interests, which is like ridiculous because I think a lot of parents and kids don't really relate to each other's interests, but you don't just be like, okay, hey, yeah, this really isn't working out. I'm not understanding like the makeup and the boys and the wanting to go to be in movies. So you got to go. That, and that's what he did, essentially. He His words were, we just decided to go our separate ways. So she leaves and she meets a sailor pretty fast. And he kind of took her under his wing and he found her work at a camp. And this was her opportunity to kind of reinvent herself. She wanted to be taken more seriously, have a more mature appearance and persona. So she started going by the name Beth when she was there or Elizabeth. But her family and friends back home used to call her Betty. So she dropped the Betty and was now Beth. And just like she did back home, she basically caught everybody's eye at the base. She wasn't a floozy though. Like I read that she made it very clear that she would entertain, you know, friendships or male friends and companions, but not anything beyond that. She wasn't there to pursue anybody or be pursued romantically. And she made that very clear. But you know, in these situations, there's always got to be that one guy 
who is like, you know what, she does, she means all of you, but not me. And sure enough, he offers his home to her because she doesn't have a place to stay. She's completely started on her own right now. And she took it as a nice gesture. And in his mind, he was like, okay, well, if I'm giving you somewhere to stay, you need to, you know, do some things for me in return. When she got there, he was like putting the moves on her and she turned him down. And this guy was apparently so upset by this rejection that he ended up giving her a black eye. So she ends up moving in with a female superior for a short amount of time and stays on the base still. But not long after she moves around California trying to find the path that she needs to make her big break. It wasn't too long after this incident at the base that she got in a little bit of trouble with friends. They were out drinking at this restaurant and I guess they were being a little bit rowdy and the police had been called and when they came they realized that she was underage. She was only 19 at the time. They arrest her. But during this arrest, I feel like this situation spoke a lot to her character and like who she truly was because the arresting officer, she was a female and she immediately was able to read how soft and embarrassed and very scared Elizabeth was of the whole situation. She wasn't like, just having fun, we're just kids. You know, she took it really seriously. She was almost like embarrassed that she got in this situation. So she goes to the police station, gets her mug shot, has nowhere to stay. And while they were waiting for a ruling on this case and what was gonna happen to her, she actually went and lived with the arresting police officer because she felt like she was just kind of with the wrong crowd at the wrong time, kids make mistakes. She knew that she was really remorseful about it. And after everything was settled, she drove Elizabeth to the bus station. She told her, you know, I think you should go back home for a little bit, regroup with the whole Hollywood plan, try to figure out something a little bit more concrete, get on a little bit more up and straight and narrow path, and then come back. She also told her she wasn't gonna tell her mom about what had happened. She knew that she felt really bad about it and didn't wanna get her in like further trouble. So she was like, you know, if you wanna talk to her about it, you can, but my lips are sealed. Like we're good over here. So I just felt like that story really showed her character. She did go back home briefly, but it didn't last too long. She wanted to, she was like steadfast on, she was like dead set on making it. So she went back to California. One of her girlfriends from Florida was actually living there at the time and she was able to hook her up with some odd jobs. I believe it was like even at a cafe that she had hosted at that she met an actor named Franchette Tone. And I guess he was very interested in getting to know her She was always, like I said, you know, flattered, but never eating it up and like, oh, (laughs) me? Okay. I guess she kind of politely let him down at first, but they carried a little bit of a conversation, had a little bit of an innocent banter back and forth. And he's like, you know, you actually have a look that one of my Hollywood connections is looking for. I think you could probably get cast somewhere if I introduce you guys. So she goes to meet with this connection of his and then when she gets to this office there's like a pull out couch in it and quickly she's like okay absolutely not and she turns him down and puts him in his place and he's like whoa like you really are not interested in me at all and a little taken back that he's like this Hollywood guy and she's saying no and that Although she wants to make it, she's not willing to compromise her morals to do it. So she just forges on. She takes odd modeling jobs here and there. Nothing big though. She goes back home for a brief amount of time. Kind of does like a whole Groundhog Day thing where she repeats like the same pattern of stopping by in Florida, visiting friends like she used to, and then making her way back to California. And then in 1945, she meets a flyer in the military and his name's Matt Gordon. And days after meeting, he proposes to her. So the plan was for them to get married as soon as he returned back from overseas. And while he was away, they wrote love letters back and forth to each other like constantly. She was a smitten kitten. Like her family said 
She was almost like pregnancy glowing. She just had this air about her. She was so in love with him. You could not get the smile off of her face. But unfortunately, they never had the chance to get married because in this tragic twist of fate, Matt dies in a plane crash. And I read that it wasn't when he was in war. It was actually days after it had ended and he was on his way back to Elizabeth. Naturally, she's just devastated and brokenhearted. It seemed like the way she dealt with that though was to keep social. She, I think she was one of those people that needed people around her. I don't think she liked to be alone with her thoughts or isolated. She liked that interaction. So that's how she distracted herself. She'd hang out at like really random places too. Like one of her spots to chill at was a pharmacy. And it sounds almost like a barbershop situation where there were like a lot of people who hung out there. And it was there actually that she got the nickname, the Black Dahlia. And it came from a popular movie that was released the year before called The Blue Dahlia. But I guess because she wore a lot of black and had like jet black hair, they did like a play on words and like switched it to her, which I found very interesting because I thought that that name came like way after when her body was found and it was like announced in papers and like given by the media. And I think there is like still some conflicting accounts from where that came, but I've read a lot of people who supported that she was already called that as a nickname and she was aware of it prior to. So I don't think that it came from the newspapers after. I do think that Elizabeth was really affected by Matt's death. And although prior to meeting him and experiencing this loss, she would kind of take male interest very, you know, casually and not think much of it. I got the impression there was kind of a shift after that point where she was like, okay, I was so close to settling down with somebody and I think she wanted that. So there were men that she had known in her past where she would kind of reach out and test the waters and say, you know, maybe things could work out between us now. I think I'm a little bit more serious and ready. But as time went on, it was almost like a pattern that I kept reading where this would happen and she would reach out and kind of play with the idea and then nothing would really materialize from there. But I do think she started relying more heavily on male companionship. I read that there was a shoe salesman that she had met at a shoe store one day and they carried on this brief affair. Nothing ever, you know, all the way. She was apparently a virgin, but they would like flirt and fool around a little bit and he would give her free shoes. So I kind of read that pattern repeating with different men. She still wouldn't take it to like a level she wasn't comfortable with, but I think she was like, you know, a girl's gotta eat. So if so-and-so wants to take me out for dinner, I'm gonna go. And it didn't seem like there was a shortage of men who were interested in courting her and doing that. So all of them pretty much have the same accounts of Elizabeth. She was very kind, sweet. She seemed distracted though, a lot of them would say. She was always like scanning the room and just not fully present. Something else they all really agreed on though was that she carried herself with a lot of class and grace and she was really intelligent. Even if she didn't know a word that somebody had said to her, she pulled out this little notebook that she carried around and she would write it down so that when she got home, she could look it up and find out what it meant. And I think this social life of hers not only was just a distraction, but almost a way of survival because she's still trying to make it in Hollywood and not booking anything. So oftentimes these male suitors of hers that wanted to take her out for dinner a couple times a week was like the only way that she ate food. I think some of them she trusted more than others. Like some of them literally were just like a meal ticket, but she would open up to those that she was closer with and be like, you know, I'm really struggling right now. I need some help. Can I borrow some money? And they'd help her along the way. Others, she would play off that she was much more successful than she was. She usually always had roommates too, or she would share a hotel room with a couple other females. And at one point she thought she found her ticket into making it into the movies when she moved in with a man named Mark Hansen. And this guy owned, I think he owned like a couple clubs, a movie theater, and he had some pretty big connections to people in Hollywood. So I read that several ladies like that were aspiring actresses would also do that. They would go and live with him and they'd get taken under his wing and hopefully, you know, make it big. And I don't know about their other people's arrangements, but for Elizabeth's, it didn't pan out at all. It sounded like he was more interested in grooming her to be 
the main attraction at one of his clubs, almost like a, I guess like a burlesque style is what it kind of sounded like. And he would be, she would be like the main feature. But we know she was not about that life, so she didn't stay. And in 1946, people who knew her in Hollywood say she just left abruptly one day. She had told some friends that she was going out to San Diego to pursue like a romantic relationship with somebody from her past. And no one that knew her knew of her pursuing somebody romantically. She she was always the one who was, you know, just going out for dinner and that's about it. So I don't know if there really was somebody she was supposed to meet, but when she did get there, if there was, she was stood up because there was nowhere for her to go. And she tried spending her first night in a movie theater because the sign had read like 24 hour movie, but it turns out the sign needed to get changed because a policy had switched forward and it was no longer a 24 hour movie theater. So One of the female ushers that worked there found her like sleeping in one of the theaters and was like, oh, honey, you gotta, you gotta go. So Elizabeth was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I thought this was like 24 hours. I've just arrived. I have nowhere to stay. Are you guys hiring for temporary work that I might be able to, you know, make a few dollars? So this employee was like, let's sort it out in the morning. You can't stay here tonight and took her home with her. Elizabeth stayed there for a while with this young woman and her mom and her little brother. I read that she kind of like took over their living room and and stayed on the couch. And this family saw very similar patterns to everybody who knew her in Hollywood also. She would sleep most of the day and then spend time going out for dinner with men that she would meet in the city. And they noticed that even though she was struggling and didn't have any money and was sleeping and living on their couch, she always presented herself like she was worth a lot more all of the clothes that she had were like in pristine condition they weren't ratty and tattered or unkept she had a really classic style and she herself was always just like done up to the nine she made sure like not a hair was out of place her makeup was pristine she just carried herself with like a lot of class and had this posh expensive look to her I think part of that had to do with the fact that inside I don't think she felt so put together I got the impression that she was really insecure. When she spoke to people, she would embellish stories and make it seem like she was a lot more successful than she was, especially when she was talking to people like in other cities that weren't from where she was in Hollywood or knew her connections. You know, she would give off the impression that she was more big time than, I mean, not even booking any jobs. And I think even losing her fiance too really tore her up because when she would talk about that situation, Anybody who didn't know them, she would say that they actually were married and that she was widowed. And I don't think she did that to be like deceitful. I think she wanted to create a closer bond to them for anybody who didn't know how much she loved him. And my heart just goes out to her because I've been there, you know, like your early 20s, you're flying by the seat of your pants. You think like, oh shit, I'm an adult. I have to have my whole life together and figured out and planned out right now. And like, you're not even close. Like I'm still learning. And I just feel so bad that she never got that chance to realize that it gets better and the confidence comes and working hard does pay off if somebody doesn't come and just like rip it out from under you. And that just sucks. While she's in San Diego, she meets a married man named Red. As all the other men, Red was very interested in Elizabeth. But it sounds like Red also had a conscience and he battled like very much with even having interested in Elizabeth because he had a wife and child at home. So although he was taking her to dinner and like whining and dining her, it sounds like they had more of a friendship and Elizabeth opened up to him more. I think she wanted, I think there was something about him that she trusted and he lived in LA, but I think he would go to San Diego for work. So uh, he would shuttle back and forth. And then on one of his trips back, she decided she felt like she didn't want to overstay her welcome at the house that she was staying at and it was kind of getting to that point because she wasn't working and like had taken over the living room and stuff so fair she decides to take a ride back with this gentleman named red and give hollywood another go so if eyewitnesses are correct elizabeth went missing the same day that she arrived back in hollywood from san diego red said he dropped her off at the bitmore hotel and she told him she was meeting her sister there and that they were going to share a room at the hotel 
But when she got to the front desk and asked for her sister, the clerk said that no one had checked in under that name. So she told Red, don't worry about me. Like, I'm just going to wait in the lobby for her and I'll be fine. I don't know if she was truly meeting her sister. As far as I know, I don't think she ever corroborated that. I think she was just saying that not to be embarrassed because she wasn't meeting anyone. She didn't have anywhere to stay, no money to stay at the hotel, but she just kind of wanted like the ride. And then she was like, I'll sort this out. You just, go, you just go. So he leaves and then hotel staff say that they do remember her hanging around the lobby for a little bit and making a few phone calls in the public phone area. And then the bellman remembers her leaving the hotel, watching her walk away, and six days later is when she was found. Like we touched on at the beginning, the condition she was found in was just horrible. There was so much that I didn't know about it. I don't want to go into too much detail, but I want to give you a little bit without getting too graphic. But like I said, there were organs that were missing of hers. Some of those areas of pieces being cut from her were like inserted back in her behind. There didn't appear to be a sexual assault, but again, it was really hard to tell because she was completely clean, like washed off head to toe. There was no trace of anything. They weren't 100% sure if there was a potential that something had gotten washed away. Another thing that was discovered was that she had an underdeveloped vagina. So it was physically impossible for her to have intercourse which may have been why she was always like friend zone dinner only. Those details weren't released to the public though, but it didn't matter because when the newspapers heard about this, like it was a complete gong show. Her mom was even contacted by the examiner and to get information out of her before she was even contacted by the police, they told her that Elizabeth had won a beauty contest and that they were contacting her friends and family to run a story on her and get to know more about her from those that are closest to her. So her mom is just ecstatic, so excited for her. She's like sharing everything. And then at the end of it, they're like, okay, yeah, sorry, actually she's gone. Like she was just found. Completely horrific. The papers also did a number on her reputation. They also used her mugshot for like cover stories to make her look bad. And it's just icky. It's like there's not enough for you to report about. Like this is pretty intense and heavy. Like why take it to the next level? And then once they interviewed more people who knew about her and got wind of this Black Dahlia nickname, they posted that on a headline and the rest is history. Like I think that honestly is one of the pieces that has kept this so alive for some reason. It's just something like haunting and notorious that's just stuck. I read the day that story broke. It was the highest number of sales that paper had ever had next to the sales of the war ending. Tons of leads came in after that issue was published, but nothing really went anywhere. It was basically more circles than anything. It was like, oh, I know so-and-so's dog walker knew her from this area. So everyone was on like a wild goose chase just trying to pinpoint people who were like, yeah, I, I knew her five years ago. And for some reason, no one could trace the final week of when she had come back from San Diego. So those whole six days were missing. And police themselves were arguing amongst divisions because they couldn't see eye to eye on what type of crime this was. There was a split between some people thinking it was like some sexual sadist who had done this. And then another side where detectives felt like this was somebody really skilled and probably a doctor who knew exactly where they were cutting and there was like a method to the madness. But it seems like neither side really got pursued because they couldn't agree. I read that there was actually 450 different officers from like all around surrounding areas on this case. So when you think about that, this was such a big deal and it's astounding that nothing was ever solved when you had that many hands on deck trying to like nail this guy. And it's not like they were dropping the ball. Like in my opinion, they were looking in sewers. They were trying to find like underground dungeons. They're like, there has to be some sort of torture chamber somewhere because the condition that she's in, like somebody would have heard something. 
but they never found anything. And the closest that they came to solving her case was usually from people who were giving false confessions. Briefly, the man Red who dropped her off in Hollywood from San Diego was looked at, but he was ruled out. I think there was even a point her dad was contacted. I don't know if he was necessarily a suspect, but I mean, his attitude was pretty questionable. I don't think he had anything to do with it, but it just shows like his character. He wouldn't even come and help the investigators to identify her body. He pretty much told them like, I don't wanna get involved. The last time I saw her, you know, we agreed to go our separate ways. And and so that's what I've just come to terms with and I'm going to do like we're just we're estranged and I can't really help you out I mean when you look at it like that you can understand a little bit where that need for male companionship probably came from her and ultimately her mom had to get flown out to LA to identify her daughter's body so I got the impression that whoever did this was definitely interested in the notoriety but not coming forward and admitting it almost toying and I think really got a kick out out of reading the newspapers and following the stories because it was such a huge deal. And then when it fizzled out and the attention wasn't as big anymore, investigators got this package and in it, there was a note that said this was the Dahlia's belongings. And then they found contents of like what would have been in her wallet, like her ID, her birth certificate, her social insurance number. So in my opinion, there's no question whoever did this was the one who sent it, but they made sure that there was no trace back to them. I didn't even know that this was a thing to like remove fingerprints, but in order to make sure no fingerprints were left behind, everything was like, so soaked and saturated in gasoline so they were never able to figure out who sent that there was speculation that whoever did this possibly had ties to somebody who knew elizabeth and who was also killed her name was georgette she was also found naked she was in a bathtub and so they suspected like the being washed and like having a connection there could be a similarity there but there was some shadiness going on in georgette's case i i if i'm if i read it correctly i and i didn't really understand because it didn't make sense but it sounds like her family was not wanting anything to be pursued or looked at further I don't know if like possibly somebody within was responsible and they didn't want them to go to jail I don't know what it was but they were very wealthy so they were like we're not looking into this further this is just a tragedy that we have to move on from so all of the like top ranking detectives were like no we're kiboshing this we're not looking into a tie any further and that's just kind of where that link got left there were quite a few other suspects that were more widely mentioned that guy mark that she lived with briefly who was like oh I'm gonna help you make it big he was a suspect but he was cleared there was also a guy named Leslie Dillon that was looked at very closely and he was accused like quite publicly and eventually everything was dropped on him too and I think people really thought that he had done it but once he was cleared he ended up suing the city for like a hundred thousand dollars which is like a huge amount of money back in those days I think the closest they ever got to solving the case was from this one gentleman and, and if you follow the case well and you know about this individual correct me if I'm wrong when it comes to names because he went by like a bunch of them but to investigators he went by the name Arnold Smith and my understanding is he approached them saying that he had some form of connection to the case and that there was like an informant that reached out to him to provide information and give him all the details of what had happened to Elizabeth. So this informant that tells like Arnold what happened says he knew a guy that had approached Elizabeth. She went to go spend time with him, turned down his advances. He got mad. He attacked her. She was unconscious. He didn't know what to do. She woke up again. He attacked her again. And then he like brought her to the bathtub while he was trying to figure out what to do. And then eventually it just was decided that he had to kill her. He did seem to know a lot about like cer how certain things happened in what order like the coroner had felt like it was actually the blows to her head and the injuries to like her face that was what killed her 
and not like the cut to her body that had happened after she had already passed. And this guy did make mention of like all of this upper stuff happening first. Another suspicious thing that he had mentioned was that this informant told him that this guy who did this to Elizabeth used like these boards for like stability in the bathtub and had them kind of like on an angle for like support. And what's interesting is that when they found her body, the lower part of her torso, like her legs were laying flat, but it's almost like she was kind of like, it's like these would be her legs. And then it was almost like this, like she was sitting a little bit like angled up, not fully, but almost like at a little bit of an angle and that wouldn't go back down. So ultimately that would have been like the position that her body had settled in. So he's giving all these details, but when it came time to him like luring this informant in for the detectives to question, he could never get a hold of this informant. So the cops are like, we're pretty sure he's making a confession and he's the guy. They needed more proof though, which they never got because he was staying in a hotel at the time and one night it goes up in flames and he dies in the fire. After the fire, when they looked into him a little bit more, he had quite a lengthy record, like a lot of assaults on there, a lot of burglaries. He had a lot of different aliases and even on his birth certificate, things were like crossed out by his mom. Like initially she had a name of a father and then it was crossed out and put to something else and then his name was crossed out and changed to match like the new father and then along the way he went by like a lot of different names that were like it's like getting like a tattoo of like an ex-boyfriend and being like nope next one like it just kept changing the best I could try to piece together was that Jack Wilson was like his original name but I don't know this guy really confused me and to this day I don't know if a lot of people even think he had anything to do with it there are still individuals that are trying to solve this case and most recently the tension has been put on a doctor named George Hoddle he was a suspect back in the day but he was never charged But it was his son who had recently discovered like a bunch of circumstantial evidence and put it together, wrote a book, went on like a huge media campaign about all that he had found, trying as best as he could to prove that it was his dad who did this. He said what initially made him think that he could have been involved was that he was going through all of his things after he had passed away and he found this chest with like a photo album in it and on like the very like back there was photos and it looked like Elizabeth Short and then the more he looked into it he felt like that letters that were sent taunting like the police matched his dad's and he was also a doctor so for me that was like the first thing I thought about I was like whoever did this they knew what the heck they were doing I thought it was a doctor so when I read about him he seemed like the most promising suspect and like I said the police did too at one point they obviously were looking at him close enough that they had actually bugged his house and they caught a conversation that he was having with a friend where he didn't really implicate himself but he like said some shady shit he mentioned something like okay well like suppose I was the one who did this they are never ever going to be able to connect me to the crime so like not the most innocent conversation but unfortunately with him as well before they could like really forge forward with like a case on him he flees to the Philippines and starts a whole new life there and I don't think it was necessarily because of Elizabeth's case but he was also looked at as a suspect to another case where his secretary was also killed And he was the prime suspect in that. Plus, his daughter had also accused him of assault and even impregnating her and giving her like an at-home abortion. There was allegedly witnesses to that that could also support her accusations against him. But when they went to trial, they completely changed their stories and said that they didn't see anything or didn't know anything about it. So all the charges were dropped against him. And his daughter was ultimately made to look like a liar. But I think a lot of people who are like re-looking into things and who were close to the family felt like he had threatened 
those witnesses and if he's the one who did do this I mean these people probably had no doubt that he would do something like that to them too and that's really as far as anything's recently gone with George I think his son was really getting some momentum and people were starting to look really seriously at all of the stuff that he had to bring forward to prove that he did it but then he went like a step further and tried to start tying his dad to being the zodiac killer so people were like whoa like you were getting somewhere and now you are just like gotta pump the brakes you're coming in too hot too strong too fast and they stopped taking him seriously so everything just went cold again but I don't know I feel like I'd have to look more into like his suspicions on the zodiac killer I totally tuned it out too I was like okay stop 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 one thing at a time but I do feel like he, in my opinion, from what I read with all the other suspects, he seems like the guy to me. Maybe just because it's like the doctor thing. It could have been another doctor, but I do think that it was a doctor and somebody skilled who did this. So I feel like that could potentially be the best option to solve this thing. But I really don't think after all of this time it's possible. And nowadays, even with all of our DNA technology, whoever did this was just so meticulous and careful. Even if you have a suspect like George Hoddle, I don't know where that tie could be to just like concretely say, yeah, it was him. Unless they find like some sort of confession somewhere, which again, all of the suspects are dead now you could never really try to poke holes in it and make sure that they're not just trying to get like notoriety and it was a false confession it's just yeah as much as I want it solved it just doesn't sound like it's possible and I just feel so horrible for her because she most definitely got the fame that she felt like she was going to have and I think her loneliness just made her so vulnerable I really feel for her I've been so sad a lot reading about Elizabeth because like I relate to her so much like me too coming out of high school I was like I want to move to Hollywood I'm gonna be a star I'm gonna make it big and those are still like dreams that I've never forgotten about and I'm somebody who believes you know like if you don't give up and you push yourself and you pursue something you can make it happen And I do feel like aside from the fame that she got now, she would have had the fame that she wanted. She had the look. She had that like stubbornness to not go back home and be like, okay, I gave it a shot. Like she was like, all right, I'm gonna go back and give it another shot. So she had what it took to to make it. Maybe that's why I feel for her so much just because I can relate. I want to know your guys' thoughts. Let me know who you guys have on your radar. I hope you were able to learn a little bit more about Elizabeth and who she was aside from just how she is remembered now. Thank you guys so much for coming to hang out with me. If you haven't already, please don't forget to like and subscribe. It means the world to me. I love and I appreciate you so, so much. I will see you in the next video and I will miss you terribly until then. Make sure to love each other, love yourself, and I will see you soon. Bye.